Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. You know why? Because I need God, but so do you. So come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord together and let's just honor the Lord with our prayer. Before I get down on my knees, I just want to encourage all of you that are online, join us in prayer. And uh, all over the world, there's like 40 or 50 different countries and the world all around the entire planet that are watching at this very moment. I want to welcome you. Get your Bible out. It's going to be great. God wants to speak today. But let's go to the, our knees. Let's go to the Lord. Put our hearts before God in prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We are grateful people. We don't have to go to church. We get to go to church. We're grateful, Father, for that in Jesus' mighty name. We're thankful, Father, for your word that is taught by the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Not a man, not a woman, but the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. It's reserved every bit of it for you to the glory of God. Now, Father, as you bless us today, we would ask that you bless all the churches of the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're our brothers and they're our sisters. We ask you to bless them as you would bless us. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans, Methodist Episcopalian, Charismatics Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels in Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis. Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination, Trinity, Emmanuel, Ecclesia, the Way. We thank you, Father, for our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. God, we don't ever at any time think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, mm -mm, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. Thank you for richly building our hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Well, get your Bibles as you take your seat. Go with me once again to Hebrews in the fourth chapter. This is kind of a miracle of a day because we're going to go actually through three verses, not three words, three whole entire verses. Isn't that amazing? So hold on, buckle up, let's go. We're going to go and have a great time in the word of the Lord. I was sharing yesterday morning, before I give you the title of the message, I'll give it to you in just a moment. I was sharing yesterday morning at at coffee. Debbie and I were having coffee together before the day started, before I came to church and ministered, before she went off and ministered somewhere. And we were having coffee together, and I was telling Debbie, I said, you know, the thing that amazes me is how Oftentimes, we as Christians forget about what God really wants to do. I said, right off the bat, God takes Adam, God takes Eve. First thing he does is he puts them into a garden. He didn't take and put them on a mountain. He didn't take them and put them in the sea on a boat or a raft. He didn't take and put them in the desert. He didn't dump them on some heap of a planet somewhere. He takes and puts them in a garden. There says so much about God. Stop thinking about it just for a moment. If you've ever been in a garden, maybe some of you have gone on vacation and there's a garden in that community and you pay a buck and a half or two bucks and you get to walk through the gardens, you know, like Huntington Gardens and different areas of Los Angeles or wherever it is that you're at. You'll walk through these gardens, the paths, the flowers, and the beauty of everything, all the plants just properly coordinated. You know, oftentimes you'll lean down and smell a rose, and maybe there's no fragrance. You've smelled the next one, and it's full of fragrance. Can you imagine a garden that was made and created by God, not tended by a man or built by a man, but the garden of God? Can you imagine how the flowers must have smelled? Can you imagine the breeze that ran through the place? 
the fragrance in that particular place, the look of your eye, it must have been one of the most beautiful places of, without a doubt on the planet. That God that cared so much about the people put them in a garden. Did you know that God is still looking to put you in a garden just like that? That God is the same God who loved them then loves you today. The same God that wanted their best wants your best. The same God that took them out of, of where they were and brought them to a place and wanted to bless them. Here's the children of Israel. He takes them out of the place of Egypt where they're in bondage and brings them where? To a promised land. What is God really saying? In the promised land, it's filled with milk and honey, blessings, far beyond that which they could ever imagine. Everything they ever needed was there in the promised land. They didn't get there because of unbelief. They didn't get there because they didn't listen to the voice of the Lord and do what God said. They wanted to do it themselves, but still it says a lot about who God is. Stop and think about it. He wanted them in the garden. He wanted to take them to the promised land. God wants to take you somewhere. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a destiny for you. There is a promised land, a personal promised land. Most people don't even know what it is, don't even believe God cares, don't even believe that there's half of God up there that doesn't even care about them at all. But from the beginning, God wants to take you to a special place which filled with milk and honey. Especially, I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about while you're here on the planet. And you will never get there unless you get there his way. Let me say that again. You will never get there unless you get there his way. If I want to get on a train, I don't get on a train to go somewhere unless I get to the station, check in, buy a ticket, get on that train. I've got to follow the rules in order to get on the train, to take the train to get somewhere. Life is just that way. It's the same way with God. If I'm going to go somewhere with God and that's going to be a good place because Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. If I'm going to go someplace with God, I'm going to have to go someplace his way, not my way because if I do it my way it isn't going to work but if I do it his way and that's what the word of God is saying to us it's an example out of the fourth chapter the fourth chapter of Hebrews if you will has been something like the if you will the author of Hebrews is like beating on the table like I really want you to get this this is really important for you to understand this is really important for you to do I want to take you to your promised land I want to bless you I want to take you to your own personal garden life I want to make life good for you I want to help you I want to strengthen you but in order for you to happen in order for it to take place you're gonna have to do it his way you're gonna have to get and buy the ticket and let me say this as we gather together and look at the word of the Lord it tells us how to get the acquire the ticket so we can go to the ride that we need to get on to is anybody listening at all it's important for all of us to see this today it's a wonderful message if you were to take the entire fourth chapter of Hebrews and sum it up. I sum it up in the title of today's message. The title of today's message is The Promise of the Rest. Listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. Until you get into the rest of the Lord, R E S T, rest of the Lord, you will never get to your own personal promised land. You will never get to that garden that he wants to have. He'll never, your life will never be as successful as you want it to be. You are not made to find your rest from anything else but from the presence of God. And when you try to find your rest from something else other than the presence of God, what you have done is you have just circumvented God and it will not work because your life has got to find its rest in who he is. I do not have rest by what I acquire, what I attain, what I accumulate. I do not find rest in what I have achieved. I find rest in who he is. And when my heart 
settles in him day in, day out. Doesn't matter what comes at me. Doesn't matter what pressures come after us. Doesn't matter what trials are against us. Doesn't matter how I don't know I'm going to make it tomorrow, how I'm going to get by, how this is going to happen. But when my heart is in rest in him, now I have the rest of the Lord. It's in his presence that I have been designed by God to find my rest. And if I try to find my rest somewhere else other than in him, then I literally void out the power of God to take me to my personal promised land, to take me to my garden like he wants to take me, to take me someplace that he knows it's best for my life. And for all of us, we're learning how to do that, that promise of the rest. I'm going to read three verses. Let's take a look at them, if you will, in the fourth chapter. Verses starting in verse number nine. Verse number nine, it says this, There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Verse number 10, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Verse number 11, let us therefore diligently to enter, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone falls according to the same example of disobedience. Now listen closely. See the words up there, example of disobedience? They missed their promised land. You, I, can miss what God has for us if we don't listen to how it is that we get to where we need to go and be what we need to be. And we can miss this whole thing and then we can end up in our life blaming God, blaming politicians, blaming society, blaming the economics, blaming education, blaming whatever. We blame everybody else instead of looking at this. God has set before you, God has set before me a personal promised land. God wants to take me to my personal garden. And it's found in his rest. And I can miss it. By not entering into his rest. Because while I'm in his rest. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. While I'm in his rest. One more time. While I'm in his rest. That opens the door for God to work on my behalf. To get me to where I need to be. But if I'm not in his rest. And I've developed my own kind of rest. It slams the door shut. And keeps me from my own personal promised land. And that's what happened with them. And they are our example. On how to be successful in life. And how to fail in life. So we look at the word of the Lord. Three things I want you to remember. Three things. Things to remember. If you will. From verses 9, verses 10, and verse number 11. First thing, three simple, simple things as we summarize, if you will, this entire chapter, the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Things to remember. Number one thing is this. Rest is available. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? How simple could it possibly be? Sometimes in the scripture, things are so simple that we stumble over them because surely it must be more difficult. And that's called a stumbling block. It's right in your path. It's right there. You know that you should step over it and go around it, but you don't. You stumble over the obvious. And God has made it so simple for us. And one of the things I found out, if people do not know it's available, they won't use it or try to accumulate it or try to do it. You need to know that every day when pressures are on you, you need to know, and so do I, that every day when problems come up, you need to know when logic wants to take its own direction and cause you to make the decisions in life based on your own personal logic, you need to know that available to you at that very moment is the presence of God. And in his presence is his rest. And in his rest opens doors that get you to where you need to be. Well, let me tell you something that's very, very important for you to see. That without the availability, you would never understand it. For an example, if I wanted to come to church, I could get here a number of ways. I could hitchhike. I could, I, 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 I could walk. Or maybe I could get in a car and drive. 
But if I didn't know the car was available, I'd end up hitchhiking and walking. You need to know that rest is available. Why? So that you don't do some other thing and you do what you're supposed to do. It's available, but you need to understand how it simply works. Listen closely. The rest I'm talking about is found in Jesus. It's not found in what you've accomplished. It's not found in how much money you have in your pocket. It's not found in how much green you have in your wallet. It's not found in what your checkbook says. It's not found in what your savings account says. It's not found, the rest I'm talking about is not whether your boss likes you or don't like you, whether you have tenure on the job or don't have tenure on the job. Doesn't matter whether you have a retirement program or don't have a retirement program. It's not found whether the economy flows or doesn't flow. May I tell you something? The rest I'm talking about is found in Christ Jesus. And when you do not know where to get it, and it doesn't make sense how to get it, you don't need to look for a check in the mail from Aunt Molly or your cousin giving you a loan or your mother borrowing money. What you need to do is you need to simply be a person that realizes that God is on the throne and you can tap into his rest anytime, any day. That's what we're talking about. And without that, my friends, we fail. And that's how the children of Israel were literally failed in what they need to do. It was available to them. They chose not to do it. Notice what it says in verse number 9. Fourth chapter of Hebrews. There remains therefore a rest. There remains therefore a rest. I can't get you there. You can only get there yourself. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. It's there for you every day to claim every day. And it's found in his presence. Is anybody listening? Jesus makes this statement, a famous statement. We all know it by heart, can quote it, but let's talk about it. Verse 28 of the 11th chapter of Matthew. Jesus is speaking, just pop it up on the overhead for us. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give, I will, I didn't, I didn't say I might, God. he didn't say I might. He didn't say, well, I'll try. He said, I if you come to me with your heaviness, you come to me with your labors, you come to me trying to accomplish something, I will give you in the midst of your accomplishments, in the midst of your labors, I will give you, oh hallelujah, give you rest. And I love how you get it. You want to know how to get it? Verse number 29, Jesus continues speaking. Take my yoke upon you and learn. See that word learn? I have to learn how to do this. I have to learn how to rest in him. I have to learn how to tap into his peace, his comfort, his ways, his security. I have to learn every day to follow him. Deborah and I just had a business deal fall out of, of, of uh, out, literally before I preached yesterday morning. We've been working on this business deal for months waiting for an answer. It came to us and it was not the answer that we wanted. We could either go along with a bad business deal, maybe something good will come out of it. We went to God and I had a rest inside of my heart. God said, shut the door. And I shut the door on that business deal. Then I got my shoes on and came and preached the gospel. I was full of the rest of God. Hear, hear me now. It's not that I don't have the end. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know. I feel I could get into the problem and find myself heavy hearted. I choose not to get into the problem and find myself heavy hearted. I choose to get, put my heart in Jesus and find myself light hearted because he's all about Jesus. Does anybody, I have to learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find. Did you notice how you're going to find something? You don't just get something. I'll give it to you, but you got to look for it. You, I will, you will find. Did you see that up there? You don't find something unless you're looking for it. 
You can put it right in your path. You can stumble over it and miss it completely. You will, he says, find rest for your souls. Verse number 30 comes along. Jesus finishes with this verse. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For every one of us, you're going to find your place in Christ Jesus. Anybody listening? Jesus says these words in John 16, chapter, in verse number 33. He says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you may have, put the word rest in there, peace, rest, joy, comfort. In me, not in the results of the world, not in what your mail delivery person gives to you, not whether your aunt or your uncle gives you money, not whether you have a job or don't have a job. Now, in me, you will have peace. In the world, when you get out of your, get out of Jesus and get into the world. Now you got economic problems. Now you got trials. Now you got pressures. Now you don't know how you're going to make it. Now you got to play politics at the job. Now you're going to try to get the boss on your side. Hopefully they give you a good retirement. Hopefully your 4013B, who you've been depositing money in every month, is going to have a government behind it that's going to support it and keep you going. Hopefully this, hopefully that, hopefully this, hopefully that. Forget that, man. Put your heart in Jesus in the world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer how can I be of good cheer the world is falling apart I'm going to tell you something I can be of good cheer because my Jesus has got no problems my Jesus is not on Prozac he is not worried about the problems and I'm in him. Be of good cheer. Sorry, I got real Pentecostal there for you. A little bit of that, all right? Pretty hard to share that and not be excited about it. It's true and it's real. We're talking about simple things. Verse number nine, it's available to you. I like verse number 10, things to remember. Things to remember, verse number 10. God is in control. You got to know that by faith. You know why? Because the circumstances you face every day says he's not. The economy says he's not. The stock market says he's not. The job market says he's not. The uh, real estate market says he's not. He is totally and completely in control. For those who are in rest in him, he will open the door to your personal promised land. Those that are worried, those that are in the world, those that are going to be frustrated, those that are going to be down and out, they're not going to get there. God is in control. Listen to what it says in verse number 10. For he who has entered, fourth chapter of Hebrews, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. I am not telling you not to get a job. <laughs> Let me make it very clear. You don't work, you don't eat. But whether you work or don't work isn't the source of your rest. You will never find rest by the government giving you money. You will only find rest in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter if you're working hard or not working hard. May I say this to you? Doesn't matter what you try to get or try not to get. You will not find rest in what you attain or what you achieve. You will only find rest in Jesus Christ every day. Didn't say you shouldn't try to accomplish something. Didn't say you shouldn't go to work. Didn't say you shouldn't get in there and make things happen. But you're going to have to go to work, make things happen, but know that your rest comes from Jesus Christ. <laughs> so important for us to see. It's hard for us to cease from our labors. You ever wondered why? We're a people that worry a lot. We're a people that want to work. We're a people that want to accomplish. We're a people that want to achieve. And may I say this to you, that's okay. First thing God gave Adam and Eve was a job, tend the garden. He's not against jobs. Tend the garden. 
We want to get in and make something happen. Have you ever wondered why inside you try to make something happen? And because you try to make something happen, listen to me now, listen to me now. Very important that you get this. Because you try to make something happen, you find your rest in what you're doing instead of who he is. When you find your rest in what you're doing instead of who he is, you must cease from your labors. Doesn't mean you stop working. It just means that I don't labor to find my rest. My rest is in Christ. Are you following me? And that takes faith. God is in control. Watch this. Why is it so hard? After Adam and Eve fell right back to the garden, Genesis 3rd chapter, God talks to serpent, says, you're going to get it, bud. I just paraphrased that, by the way, in case you didn't know that. For those of you that don't read your Bible. Talks to the woman, you're in trouble, girl. <laughs> then he talks to Adam. Verse 17, the third chapter. Here's what he says to Adam. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree in which I commanded you, saying, go on, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, see the words in toil? If you wonder why you got to keep working, you think you're working, you want to draw your peace and your rest and your comfort from your own personal labors. I didn't say don't stop laboring. I just said don't labor for rest. Rest comes from God. Watch this. In toil you shall eat all the days of your life. Go on to the next verse 18. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herbs of the field. Verse 19. In the sweet of, sweat of your face, you shall eat the bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and for dust you shall return. Is that not the truth? Listen to closely what it says. It says, for the sweat of your face. But we have a tendency to believe that the supplier of the bread is my effort. The supplier of the bread is the king of glory. Are you following me? He's the one that brings the rest. He's the one that takes me to the garden. He's the one that's got a personal promised land. He's the one that knows what's best for me. Is anybody listening? We're talking about a very important subject. Let me tell you, let me give you an illustration of the subject. Did you know the Gentiles get God when they weren't even in God? The Jew missed God when they were trying to find God. They had access to God and missed God. Did you know you can have access to God and miss God? Now listen to this, because it's all about faith. What's faith? Knowing God is in control. God said, here's your personal promised land. Oh yeah, there's giants, but I know God's in control. And I'm going to go to my personal promised land. Why? Because I am in rest in him. I am not rest in defeating the giants. I'm in rest in him and he will defeat the giants. Are you following me? Now listen to this. So it's all about knowing that God is in control. The children of Israel have access to God, miss God. The Gentile, the word Gentile is an interesting word. It means a people without a God, without a covenant or agreement with God. And so the Gentile gets God for one reason. Let's take a look at it. Will you look at it with me for a moment? It's really fascinating. It'll help you in your walk of faith. Let's take a look at it. Romans, the ninth chapter, starting in verse number 30. Romans, the ninth chapter, in verse number 30, says it like this. It says this, what shall I say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have obtained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, verse number 31, but Israel pursuing the laws of righteousness have not obtained the laws of righteousness. In other words, they had access and didn't get there. The ones that didn't have access got there. It was all about who's in control. It was all about believing God. It was all about faith. It was all about trusting the Lord. They found their faith in who God was. Now watch this. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. But as it were, by the works of the law. In other words, they're going to work it trying to get to God. They were not at rest. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Here's this easy path. They stumble over it. 
What's the stumbling stone? Verse number, if you will, 33. For as it is written, behold, I lay a, in Zion a stumbling stone, the rock of offense. Wherever, whoever believes on him, meaning Jesus, will not be put to shame. The Gentile comes along, believes in Jesus. Jew comes along and says, I'm going to win my relationship with God by works, not about works. It's about you knowing God's in control. When you know God's in control, it's that simple. The path is open to your personal promised land or that garden area that God wants to put you in with your home, family, children, finance, dreams, vision, destiny, your future. Does anybody listen? Three simple things out of these verses. The first one is so great. Rest is available. Second thing, God is in control. Third thing, this is a wild one. Are you ready? Let's take a look at verse number 11 of the fourth chapter. But here's the third thing. Diligent. Work hard at rest. <laughs> We're going to have to work hard at rest. Working hard to be at rest. I don't want to be at rest. I want to be worried. I want to do something. I want to finish every day. Fall down on the couch and say, wow, whew, I really put in a good day. I whew, feel good about myself instead of saying, wow, I've got Jesus and I feel good about myself because I'm in him. Yeah. Is anybody listening? I'm going to have to work hard at it. And I've got to be diligent. Verse number 11 says, let us therefore, because of what I just said, be diligent to enter that rest. Least anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. All of a sudden he comes along and makes it very clear. We're going to have to be diligently working at being at rest. you know why? Because tomorrow the problems come up and if you're not at rest, the problems will overwhelm you. Every day you're going to have to diligently work at this. Every day you're going to have to diligently remember my peace, my rest, my comfort, my direction is from Jesus. All I need to do is get in Jesus and do what? No, number two, he's in control because I know, number one, it's available to me. Wow. Is anybody listening? And I've got to diligently, if I don't diligently work at this, then all of a sudden I'm back in the routine of trying to produce something, trying to accomplish something, trying to achieve something, trying to attain something in order to find my rest. And guess what? That, now listen to me, this all comes from Wednesday night teaching, left side, right side, flesh, how to control the carnal mind. Remember that? If those of you that are here on Wednesday night, you'll know what I'm talking about. You will never please God with what you produce from your flesh. Scripture makes it very clear. Why? Because what you produce from your flesh comes from the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. And God's not looking for production from the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. I followed the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, and I accomplished it on my own. And God says, oh, how wonderful. I've been waiting for you to do that. That is not what it's about. It is a relationship you have with God, you and God together accomplishing something that he has planned for your life. Is anybody listening? <laughs> so every day, every way, every time, every hour, I can be at rest because it's number one, available to me. Number two, it's not only available to me. John put them up. Number one, it's available to me. Number two, it, God is in control. Number three, I've got to diligently work at this or I'll fall back in the bad patterns of my flesh and never produce what I need to do to go on to the garden of my life, which is that promised personal promised land that God has for me. And I'll end up just like these people that had a relationship with God who failed in the wilderness instead of going on to the personal promised land. God loved them. God loves us just exactly the same, and therefore we have Jesus to get us across the finish line. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't that good? I, I, let me summarize it, and maybe John, you can pop this up for us. So it's hard work not to work hard. <laughs> Does that screw you up? 
So it's hard work not to work hard because I'm in the promise of the rest of God. My tendency is I want to work at this. Make it happen. You don't make anything happen. Get in him and he makes it happen through you. Come on, somebody. Isn't that good? Isn't God good? I just want to make sure everybody's all right. Listen, by the way, we're going to feed you and have a great 4th of July service out in the courtyard, barbecue, lots of fun. And then we're going to let you go find your favorite fireworks show somewhere else and let somebody else pay for the, that's called wisdom, they'll pay for the fireworks show. But we'll feed you and have a great time before that. Is that okay? I'm going to ask all of you just to remain seated. Nobody get up. Come on, a lot of you have gotten up already by hundreds. But just take a moment. Nobody move. Nobody walk around. Because when you move and walk around right now, what you're doing is disturbing people's concentration. I may be just speaking a point to them that God wants them to hear. And what happens is their concentration is broken because of your movement. So understand what I'm asking you not to move around. Stay seated. I'm speaking to you, please. I'm being real nice about it. So come on, let's have some good church etiquette. Let's talk just for a moment. What makes you think you're going to heaven? If I was to ask you this question, what makes you think you're going to heaven? And you answered the question, guess what? That would tell a lot about where you're at and who you are. Some of you might answer the question and say, well, Pastor Jim, I think I'm going to make it to heaven. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven. Like whoever is the most positive thinker is going to get there. You're not going to get there. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I hope. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope your way into heaven. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say to me, well, Pastor Jim, I, I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God, you get to go to heaven. Some of you might even say to me, well, Pastor Jim, I know who Jesus is. I'm going to go to heaven because I know Jesus. Can I tell you something? The devil knows Jesus, and he's not going to heaven at all either. So it's not what you have in your head that counts either, is it? You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I, I've really been a good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible, again, nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Now listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. Jesus says these words, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way except his way. That's right. His way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. You're not going to get there some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven God's way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. I'll share it with you in just a moment. Some of you think you're going to go to heaven because your mom and dad told you you were a Christian when you were a kid. Maybe they took you to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when you were a child. Hey, that's great, but did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say your mom and dad could tell your Christian, take you to those classes? No, it doesn't matter if they put a cross around your neck or a St. Christopher around your neck. doesn't matter. You're not going to make it. doesn't matter if they had you christened or baptized when you were a baby. You're not going to make it. It's not in the scripture. You're not going to make it. So you think you're a Christian when you're not, and that's the worst part to ever be. Now listen to this. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. It's very, very important that you hear this. Jesus makes it very clear and tells us how to get to heaven. John 3rd chapter. He says, you must be born again. When people hear the words born again, they immediately turn off because Hollywood has trained you to think about born again people as idiots and fanaticals and radicals. But I'm here to tell you that's not the way it is. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus says, I'm coming again, and when I come, 
He says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he really just said? People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. That's what he just said. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus when he comes. Wow, what a crude, rude, blunt statement. Can you imagine Jesus who loves you saying something like that? He loves you so much telling you like it is. I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now listen to these words. I'm going to tell you the truth. Listen. So if people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not going to make it, and the Word of God proves that, then what's lukewarm? Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Lukewarm. Token prayer, occasional church again, attendance. That's lukewarm. Here, here's lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. You know, you're not against God, but you're just not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And when he just is something, he will never be the everything until you make him everything. And you're going to have to do that. How? By giving God all of your heart. How? By giving God all of your life. You notice how I emphasize the word given? Listen to why. Listen to why. He's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of your heart and life. He's not a manipulator to make you do this. He's not hitting you in the head with a two by four until you finally come around to his way. He gave you a free will choice. It's your call, your choice. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Today you have a divine appointment with God. Today it is your day of salvation. Don't miss this day. God brought you here for a reason. Today is your day. And you say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? How do I do that? Well, let's do it God's way, not my way or your way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And when I pop my hands together, you'll hear this sound. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see your hand go up. And then you can put it right back down. But the raising of your hand, here's what you're saying. I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. Be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. And I'll see your hand go up. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He said, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. Wow. But he says, if you deny me, sit there and know where you need to get your hand up, but you don't. He says, you denied me and I will deny you. Trust me, Jesus is not a liar. Nobody needs that. Nobody wants that. Today is your day of salvation. I don't care if you're an older person like me or a young person. Average age of this church is 30 years old. I don't care what age you are. Let me tell you something. It's your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three. I've done my job. I've been running from God again. Instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Never giving him all of your heart. I'm speaking to you. One of those people that have never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that just are not sure if you really have, make sure and get right with God. Today is your day. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Nine. Thank you. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifty. Thank you. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Two. One. Two. Eight. Two. Two. Three. Two. Four. Two. Five. Thank you. Back here. Anybody else? Real quick. There's twenty-five wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's twenty-five wise people. There's twenty-six right here up top. Twenty-seven. Thank you. God bless you in this family room. Is there one in the family room? Twenty-eight. Thank you. If there's twenty-eight, there's twenty-nine right here. Gotcha. You can put your hand down. Thank you. God bless you. There's 30 back there. Anybody else? There's another one back up on top. 30, 31. Thank you. 32 back over here. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 32 wise people that need Jesus that are coming home to Jesus. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 32 wise people. Here's what we want to do. Here's what we want to do. All 32 of you and, 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 anybody that should have raised their hand, but you didn't but you know you should have. All 32 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. I just want the people 
that raised their hand and anybody that should have raised their hand, get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me in front. Check with your neighbor and say, come on, neighbor, I'll go with you if you need to go. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. They're coming, give them a hand as they come. Come on out of the family room, hurry. Hurry, 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 come on. They're still coming, give them a hand. Help me know you. Thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God. You have come. God is so good. All of you in front, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You know, you're not going to the morgue. You're going to heaven. That ought to make you happy. And I want you to look to your left. Here's Pastor Dave. He's waving at you. He's really a good guy. No weird stuff, no strange stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are so you don't be afraid. Number one thing he's going to do is he's going to lead you in a prayer. Listen to why. You need to invite Jesus into your heart. Jesus does not come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. Now he's a gentleman and you need to invite him to come in. He'll lead you in a prayer to do that. Is that okay? Second, he's going to give you some free stuff. Take it home, read about what to do next now that you're a Christian. Free, absolutely free. Third, he'll introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You say, what's that? Ah, he'll tell you, friends. Someone will work with you, pray with you, encourage you. You know why? Because we don't want you to go back, fall through the cracks. We want to help you go on with Jesus, become that victorious person that God paid the price for you to be. Only takes a few moments, please. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, everybody. Let's give the Lord a great big praise.